Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. Now our job here is to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season or the off season in this case. Now for those of you who haven't listened before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. As ever, I'm of course joined by my colleague Neil Perrett, who's been covering the Cherries for over 30 years and continues to be a fountain of AFC Bournemouth knowledge. Neil, we're in the middle of the summer break. Not much has been going on, has it? Been fairly quiet, actually. Uh, Zoe, as as per normal during the summer, just the uh, change of a head coach, uh, England losing the first Ashes Test match pre-season, just about to start, so... It's all been going on. (laughs) Well, it's going to be really, really exciting over the next few months and the season ahead. And we've got a really exciting guest here today. I've got no doubt there's going to be a lot of laughter over the course of the next hour because this guest lives and breathes the Cherries. She's been a core player for the women's team ever since 2017, and she's a huge part of the club. Now, without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Katie Scadding onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Katie, it's great to see you. It's great to have you here. Tell us, how have you been? How's your summer going? Yeah, it's been good. It's been a nice, uh, deserved break. Um, it was quite a long season, but it's even better that the sun's shining and we've managed to have some well-deserved time off. Just tell us about that sun shining, because first of all, you look very, very tanned. Where have you been? <laughs> yeah, so I've uh, been living it up in Spain and Portugal for three weeks, um, playing beach soccer. So the off-season, try and make the most of it and play the sport that I love that is still football, but not on grass, on sand. So just tell us a little bit about where, where you've been and what you were doing and how it all, all panned out over there. Yeah, so I'll um, go out there and play for one of the Spanish teams who play in the Spanish league. So um, they have three sections that they call phases. So the first phase was in a place called Roses. Um, so we were there for three to four days, then head down to Cacares. And then um, the third phase isn't until July. So hopefully go back out there and fingers crossed we'll finish in the top four, currently sitting third. So... Yeah, it's a great experience all round. Now, you're a goalkeeper and you once played with a broken wrist. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, so it takes me back a while. Um, I think it was my first season within the women's game and um, it was in a cup final and the game was neck to neck and we were playing money fields and I'd come out for a 1v1 and knew something bad had happened but didn't believe that I'd broke my wrist and just thought I'll be all right and carried on playing. Um just kept asking the ref how long was left knowing that I was in quite a lot of pain but I think there was about eight minutes and I just the excitement of being in a cup final just got me through it and luckily we won so it was worth every minute you've also got a Wembley appearance on your CV tell us about that one yeah so that goes back right to the start um from when I can remember being at this club um I was at Broadstone Middle and we were in the school's competition um and we the final was at Wembley and we played um, a school from up north that had never even heard of the area that they were from, and we beat them in the final 1-0. And that was the start of it, really. I think that was the first time I put on a Bournemouth shirt as a player and haven't looked back since. What, what was the experience like of playing at Wembley? I mean, they normally, did they make it two or three pitches on the main pitch, I would imagine? Or? Um, so we just had one seven-a-side pitch, um, sort of in the middle, and our parents and close friends were sat in the executive area. So it was just surreal even being surrounded by that many seats. Um, They weren't filled up, but it was still a great day out. And at the end, obviously, we won. So walking up the the stairs and lifting the trophy was unbelievable. And one that I remember every year Um, we played in, it was in May. And I still come May every year. And I look back and can remember those special moments. Now, another very special moment for you. You've got a European Championship winner's medal. Just tell us about that. Yeah, so again, goes back to Beach Shocker. Um, it was my first tour um, to be like, selected to go away. Um, and it, just the experience was incredible. Um, I didn't play that tour, but just to be around it and um, have the experience of being in a different country and obviously in a competition that um, is quite big and known. So yeah, it was just really good. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that football brings, whether it's on the grass or the sand. Now, away from the pitch, you're also a coach with the Community Sports Trust. Just tell us a little bit more about, you know, how your working week looks, because that obviously involves a lot of weekend work, evening work, that sort of thing. Yeah, so um work full time for the community and have been there a while. And I started as a little 16 year old girl um, as an, on an apprenticeship um, and 
yeah, I've just gone up since and worked my way into full time and, you know, different sessions every day, like no day looks the same um, and really enjoy it. Like seeing the smiles on the kids' faces when we come into their school just makes their day. And I remember when the community used to come into my middle school and they'd bring power strike down and things like that, that you just will always remember as your school memories. I remember, I think my first year here was also your first year as an apprentice. I remember coming to a school with you and Steph Small, another one of our, our AFC Bournemouth women goalkeepers. And it was great to see, you know, you girls out there engaging with the local community. How much do you feel you've grown as a person and your confidence has been boosted in the last sort of six, seven years? Yeah, definitely. I think some people won't believe it, but I've matured as a person um, off the pitch massively, but even on the pitch. And I think it's just down to the experiences that the club's given me um but yeah I love what I do and hopefully continue to do it forever you were named the PFA community champion for AFC Bournemouth in 2021-22 that must have been a, a great honour and testament to the work that you do yeah definitely I didn't expect it at all I don't I wasn't even sure that I knew the award existed um especially not at our level but you know to be noticed and of the work that I put in off the pitch and on the pitch for the community it's nice to get something back but it's not the reason to do it it's the reason you do it is because of the love and enjoyment of it so to be recognised just means that a little bit more Now you're a key member of our women's team here at AFC Bournemouth you've won three promotions in your time here how has the setup evolved over you know over those years? Yeah definitely to look back from when I started at an under 16 to now regularly playing in the first team I think it just goes down to the connection that the club and the community have um, and it just has evolved each year. There's always something exciting going on and whether that's in the plans or not, it just keeps going and there's always something to look forward to. Just to give people a flavour of what you do, you are here now doing this podcast between sessions. So tell us what you've done this morning and what you're doing this afternoon so people know. Yeah, so like I said, every day just looks different. Um, this morning we had a group from Kinson Primary come in um, and they're all young carers. So outside of their school life, they've got it tough at home. Um, and they just came in to have a little break and we gave them a tour of the stadium, which they were really appreciative of. And then obviously what we all love doing is getting out on the grass and playing some football. Um, and then I've got a little break now, which obviously brought me here to the podcast and then head off to Lilliput after school club to teach the kids football in year two. So, yeah. Brilliant. Now, we're just talking about how the setup has evolved. What about the facilities? Can I remember sort of first team players talking about, you know, when they used to train at Chapel Gate and, and places like that. And now we're looking at a, a state of the art training ground be, being built nearby. What what can you remember about the facilities when you sort of first came in? Yeah, definitely. So when I first started, we didn't really have a base. We were just training. Um, we trained at the stadium. We trained at uh, Camford Magna on the 3G. And our games just used to be sort of here and there, but obviously, especially this season, we've been more based at the club and we've had more opportunities. Um, and just to be at Ringwood where the community and currently the women's team are based, it just shows that the way it's going of even being thought of to have that facility and be able to play at the same place every week. And now you're in the, you're in the National League, which is the fourth tier of the women's game and you finished fourth in your league last season a lot of really young players were given their debuts that must have been a really encouraging sign for the future yeah definitely I think it just goes to show of the pathway that we have here and that the credit to the club and to Steve of what of what they've um, developed here but yeah credit to them as well you can't just walk in to the first team you've got to work hard and I think they've done that since they joined the club so they deserved it and I think it would be a good um stepping stone for their careers when I say young players there's the rule that they're not allowed to play until their 16th birthday in the first team I, I think that's well I know that's right so when I say young players I'm talking about 16 17 I mean you're only 21 you must feel like a veteran yeah I do uh, joke around that how I've become one of the so as they say senior players I still don't believe it um, I think I get on better with the 16 year olds I definitely feel a lot older um, I think it's good to have that balance in the team of the younger ones and the older ones that are more experienced and I've just sort of been sat in the middle but it's been quite nice to be recognised as one of the senior players and I think that just goes down to the club and how long I've been here and that could be some of uh, the 16 year olds in a few years down the line. Now you captained the team a couple of times last season that made, must have made you feel incredibly proud. 
yeah, I think it's one of those that you don't really look into, but come the day when Steve says you're going to be the captain for that game and stuff like that, it's just nice to be recognised, and especially when the club means that little bit more to you, it, you know, it does make you look back and appreciate of what you've done and where you've come from. Um, but I think whether you've got the captain's armband or not, everyone has different roles and responsibilities and to be that team leader on and off the pitch is just nice. Now, am I right in thinking that you went to the same school as Kelly Fripp, Caitlin Elliott and Molly Gladwell? Yeah, correct. So I went to Caulfield's school. That's amazing. I mean, you know, to have four girls from the same school, all in the local area as well, playing for the same team, you know, representing AFC Bournemouth. What, what an accolade that is. Yeah, definitely. I, um, Kelly was uh, the year above me but I don't really remember coming across each other at school and obviously uh, Caitlin and Molly are there or they're just finishing from there. So, yeah, I actually didn't know that Molly was there until um, the other week when we were just happened to talk about schools and she said, and both of us were a bit shell-shocked that we had been at the same school and some of the teachers are still there. It just shows of how like a small and close place Bournemouth is. Now, in the league this season, it was a tussle between Cardiff City and Exeter for that one promotion spot. Cardiff got it in the end, but would you like to sort of see a second promotion spot be given in the division? Because it's so competitive, there's so many good teams, and to be fighting for one space is is tough. Yeah, I think it's definitely tough, and I know that there's been a few things um, on social media and the leagues have been talking about it to try and change that. Um, for us, last year, we finished second, and for only one team to go up, it's heartbreaking really for all of the work that you've done for the season and knowing there's only a reward if you get to the top um, but even more so you look at Exeter this year and they finish on the same points as Cardiff but just to miss out on goal difference I think just to keep the women's game growing it just needs to be two up and two down just to keep the leagues flowing but there's definitely a good uh, competition in it and hopefully soon it might be that two can go up into the next league you're mentioning that year that we finished second. I mean, in the end, it came down to that one game against Cheltenham, really, at the end of the season, that it was neck and neck. And to define a league on on one game is, you know, after such a long season, you have two teams that are outperforming the rest. It's it's tough to take, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely um, harder to take when you know it's down to one game and you can feel the pressure, but you also know that the other result needs to go your way and sometimes the luck of the draw doesn't but you know we've all still got that goal in mind and hopefully this year will be the year that we can push on and keep developing now you've uh, just answered my next question actually you've got three new teams joining the division this year Bridgewater Abingdon and Torquay so what are your hopes for the season yeah definitely I think we've all got the same ambition um us players to the coaches and the club we want to thrive and keep uh, pushing on as much as we can and I think the new teams coming into it just makes it a little bit more exciting um, we've come across Bridgewater before in pre-season friendlies um, I think we've played Torquay a while back when I first started within the women's team um, and then Abingdon as well we've played them within the southern region so I think it again just brings good competition and hopefully we can stick to our uh, goal and get that completed your boss Steve Cuss is old club talky as well so I'm sure he'll be looking forward to a trip down there yeah definitely I know that club means a lot to him and it um, obviously was the start of his career but I know deep down that he'll want us to beat them and hopefully that we can give him that result now I know you're very modest and you said that you didn't really want to talk about the Hampshire Senior Cup final but we're going to have to because it's very uh, a big chapter of your last season for anybody listening who doesn't know what happened Katie saved three penalties during a penalty shootout win against Southampton in the final at Fratton Park and she scored one herself. Let's ask you about the 90 minutes first. Was 1-1 one, one a fair reflection? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it was a team that we hadn't come across before so we knew it was going to be a tough challenge but we were also excited for it. Um, I think the first 20 minutes we weren't at our best and knew that we were going to have to graft to get the result and we went 1-0 down and I think it just shows what we have as a team to mentally battle and to just keep working to get that result and the game finished 1-1 and we all knew that there was no extra time and it was straight to penalties um, and yeah. Now you nearly saved the first two penalties in that shootout getting a hand to the first and parrying the second into the roof of the net 
being ultra critical should you have done better with either of those <laughs> yeah definitely i've watched the videos back a few times and i was so annoyed but i try not to look back because on the day we got the result but had it have gone the other way i think i would have continued to beat myself up about it now after your first save you then took your penalty before taking it am i right in thinking you poked your tongue out at someone <laughs> yeah i think uh someone had given me a signal in the crowd and i just thought i've got to play along with it here don't let it get into the head and just uh gave him a bit of a, a look and <laughs> gave him the tongue did they react um i think they just laughed and <laughs> just sort of looked at me like what was i doing but it all worked out well now did you volunteer to take that penalty after the 90 minutes or had you kind of pre-planned who was going to take them before before the game yeah i think it's um we had trained on the sunday before and the game was on a tuesday night so we had had a few penalties just in training um and then come the end of the night minutes steve had his list of people that wanted to take it and there was a few that didn't want to go in the first five and obviously being well as they say so one of those senior players i felt like i had to step up and um first second and third had been taken and everyone sort of just looked gormously at fourth so i took took it fourth and luckily connected with it well and it hit the back of the net no, it went to 8-8. What was going through your mind when you walked into the net when it was 8-8 with that ninth penalty? Well, it wasn't the ninth penalty because you'd already saved a couple, but what was it like? What was going through your mind when that person stepped up to take that final penalty? Yeah, to be honest, I hadn't, I'd lost track really of what was going on. I had to keep asking the referee um, sort of what was happening now. And I know that we had scored and that if they missed, it would be game over because it was sudden death. And the player that um, stepped up was my teammate at Bournemouth for under 16 so um, I know that she was gutted and messaged me after but to save the penalty I think gave a sigh of relief for everyone um, also knowing that if they had scored that one we would have had to go back to the start and um, I think it was KJ who would have had to step up again so I'm glad we just did one round and not two. For anybody listening who hasn't seen the penalty shootout log on to afcb.co.uk because it is fantastic and I've got to ask you really high quality penalties from both teams yeah definitely I think when there's 17 penalties and not one individual missed the target just it's you couldn't really write it um and some of the penalties that hit the back of the net from us and from the other teams were great strikes and penalties is never a nice way to go out of the competition but when you win it it means that a little bit more just give a name check to the uh, people who scored. It was you, Katie James, Molly Clark, Helen Blizzard, Maisie Smith, Kelly Fripp, Caitlin Elliott, Molly Gladwell and Lucy Cooper all scored. How did the celebrations go that night? Yeah, definitely. They didn't go as wild as probably some people thought. You know, we had work the next day. Um, I think some of the girls even had an exam for their GCSEs. So um they were short and sweet in the changing room but we had the karaoke machine on and everyone was singing and dancing um and yeah it was a great night and one that we'll always remember i think that just sums up you know at the moment where the women's game is and you know we we watch the men's team here week in week out and then you've got players representing the women's team who have gcse's the next day they've got work the next day you know it's quite a commitment we're going to come on to the commitment a little bit later but it is you know it's you give up a lot of time to play for this club yeah definitely but we all know it's worth it and what we get back just makes it that little bit um better that we know whatever we give we'll get something back of course the other thing you've got to remember is there's a lot of people in there who can't celebrate by drinking champagne or anything like that as well yeah there was unfortunately for us that were over 18 there was no champagne but the Lucas aid and the water was flying around the changing room <laughs> I can imagine you were front centre stage of those celebrations knowing what you were like um yeah I was there a little bit um especially with the water just uh telling myself that it was champagne um but to be fair KJ was uh up on the changing room dressing table as you say and having a little boogie up there so let her have a limelight for a few minutes <laughs> now another really memorable moment from the season was when you played Maidenhead United here at Vitality Stadium in April you've obviously played at the stadium before but what was that like there was a big crowd here compared to what, what, what there has been before yeah definitely again it's one of those that we'll look back on and playing at the stadium is so special to all of us but when you've been here for seven seasons it it's really rewarding um, and again the crowd made that experience ten times better um, to have 
almost doubled in fans from last year just shows how much the women's game has grown and I think that's down to the Lionesses and their success in the Euros but it's just um, good to see that it's still affecting our level and that hopefully we can keep progressing. Yeah we're going to talk about those Lionesses a little bit later on but being an AFC Bournemouth fan can you sum up how it feels you know to be walking out here at Vitality Stadium wearing the badge? Yeah definitely I remember um, coming to the games with my uncle and um, Mark Luther who also works at the club and Every now and then I used to come in, sit in the North Stand and, you know, watch uh, Bournemouth play in sort of League One and to know their journey that they've had to be a part of that and then have my own journey within the club and be able to come out to, as we know, it's Dean Court and the Vitality Stadium. Just, yeah, one of those that I'll always look back on and have lots of photos and memories from that day and even better when we get the good result. I suppose you can almost draw parallels between the journey that the men's team has been on over the years and the journey that the women's team is now on, you know, trying to rise up through the divisions, trying to get to the top tier, trying to make a name for for the team. There's a few parallels there. Yeah, definitely. I think obviously you can never compare the men's and the women's games, but the journey, we're trying to go in the right direction. And I think that we've got the men's journey to follow. And I know that they've done the club proud, so hopefully we can continue to do so. Who are your Cherry's idols? Yeah, so I think when I go back to saying that I used to come to the games, um, it used to be the goalkeeper, Jalal, um, and I know he's at Newcastle now with Eddie, so it's nice to still be able to follow his journey, but he was the one that I looked up for um, and was obviously in the same position as I, but even more so now, probably um, Mary Earps. I know that she's had a massive effect on a lot of people, especially on and off the pitch. Um, I don't think her career has been the easiest but it just shows the strong person that she is to dig deep at it and I think that some of us can compare to that and um, yeah she just keeps you going and one to look up to that's also in the women's game and is succeeding. Now the women's setup here has made enormous strides under the Community Sports Trust and it's now being bought under the direction of the football club. This is a huge statement of intent from the owner. What's it like as a player to hear this news? Yeah, definitely. I think the community have done so well of um, supporting the women's team and I know that they'll still support it, but to be taken under the club is just, again, down to the growth um, of the women's game and we're really excited to see what that has in future for us as players. As Zoe said about the commitment earlier on, not including your job role here as a player. Just give us a run through of how your week goes concluding with the game on a Sunday. Yeah, so we um, train sort of two to three times a week um, in the evening. So you've obviously got to be committed to be there to train and um, not just individually, but to be there as part of the team. And then obviously um, games on a Sunday, whether they could be home or away. Um, I think our furthest trip was Cardiff, um, and down to St Austell so I'm glad we haven't got to do a Cardiff this year but I think it just comes down to the commitment levels of us players but also of the club and Steve and Matt as well that put in the same amount of time that we do um, and hopefully you know we'll always be committed and we'll keep growing forwards. Everybody comes to the Premier League game sees the players over there with the nice cars and wages this that and the other but what a lot of people don't see is teams like the women's team and the youth team turning up here at six o'clock in the morning getting in a minibus and driving in here there and everywhere so you really have got to throw yourself into it yeah definitely and I think I've always said to myself you know whatever you put in you're always going to get back out and you know when we've got to go on a Sunday to Cardiff um, there and back in the same day it's it's tough but when you then get to play at the Vitality Stadium, it all comes down to that and this, this, you do the dirty work to get the good rewards. So. You're now playing your home games at Ringwood Town's Long Lane. Just tell us a little bit about what's happening there. There's been a new development and a new hub. Yeah, I think it's exciting as well. Um, they obviously cracked on with a 3G pitch straight away so that we had a home to train at um, all the time and the pavilion is underway I believe and um, they just look after the facilities really well there and I think since we've been at Ringwood week in week out and that's been our home um, we've had a lot more spectators come along week in week out and um, we've had a couple hundred at each game and we're really appreciative of that. Now eventually the women's team will be using the club's new training ground I appreciate that 
you won't know too much about this just yet. We don't quite know how it's going to look and how it's all going to work. But it's a, another really exciting development, isn't it, to have everyone kind of in one place, first team academy, women's team. It, it kind of creates this one club mentality a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I think um, everyone knows about the one club mentality and that everyone's on the same path and it's a everyone that supports the club or that works within the club knows that it's, it's more than just a club. It's a family and a home to a lot of people. And I think that will just... Um, show that even more of everyone being in the same same place and ultimately achieving the same goal. Effectively, you could be sort of in the right the right club at the right time because Zoe's touched on the the, the training ground, the, the new owners bringing the the, the team in, in house, if you like. It's such an exciting place to be at the moment in the women's team. Yeah, it's definitely exciting, and I look back from when I first started of what we had to what we've got now and. If I looked back at seven years ago, I wouldn't have even thought that there'd be talks of us at the new uh, training facility and even playing at, um, on the pitch. But it just goes down again to the growth of the women's football. And it's really nice to see that the club are doing their part in to help us do that journey. I think it's it's fair to say that in seasons gone by with rivals so close as Southampton and Portsmouth who are in a league above you that there would have been a tendency to lose players to them as they progress but hopefully now that that won't happen as, as much as it has in the past maybe. Yeah definitely I think you know all the clubs are on the same page they want to be playing at the highest league possible and these days you need a um, club like Bournemouth to back that and let the journey sort of take its toll but yeah it's just an exciting time to be around the club but it's even more exciting when you've been here for so long and you can see the journey. Something else that must have impacted on you is the success of the Lionesses winning the Euros last year, the World Cup taking place in Australia and New Zealand starting next month. How how have you found this has impacted on you as players if you like? Yeah definitely I think before sort of they went to the Euros you'd hear of the women's team but even their support that they would have, it would never be as many as they've had now. They've had sell-out crowds, sort of um, fixture after fixture. So I think it goes down just to the whole growth of women's football across the world. And um, yeah, it's just nice to see and it gives us something even more so to look up to. So with all the growth that's happened with people coming to to the games, has that come down to your level as well? Have you seen more people at Ringwood? Yeah, definitely. I think um, when we first started and we were based at Ringwood, we probably had sort of around 100, whereas now week in, week uh, week in, week out, sorry, we get a couple hundred and it's the same faces that we see and uh, throughout the different weeks and depending who we're playing, we'll get some new faces and it's nice that we tend to see the same ones come back. Um, And even sort of going back to my job when I go into schools and sort of they'll recognise and notice that they were at our game at the weekend. It's nice to see. Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, hopefully still here, but I'll just try and take each season as it comes and um, just take whatever is thrown at me and just take every opportunity with both hands. Now, we always like to get some supporters questions in, Katie, and we've had some in for you. First one is from Steve. Who are the worst and best dressed teammates? Oh, it's a tough one. Um, we only usually see each other in training kit, but I don't think I can say a worst dressed, but best dressed, um, just going to mm, go with Molly Clark. OK, John wants to know what you eat before a match. It's always pesto pasta. It's my favourite. And Brian is asking if you have any superstitions. Um, I'm not too big on superstitions, but I do it day in, day out and... It always like left sock first, left shin pad first, and then left football boot, which I'm really surprised because my left foot is horrendous, but it's always been the left. It's funny, every time you ask that question about suspicions, people say, no, I haven't got any, but I always put my right boot on first. And that is a, that is a superstition. <laughs> now, David is asking, what colour boots do you wear and what colour boots would you like to wear as a goalkeeper? Well, I've always been uh, either a black boot, I think, I pushed the boat out last year and had grey boots with a bit of yellow and blue on. But they have just released the new um, sort of old school tempos and they're orange and I have been tempted, but I'm not sure they'll go too well with the new kit. I've got to ask as well, when you're playing beach soccer, you play it barefoot. So is the ball modified presumably to 
you know, so it's not as hard to kick. Yeah, I don't, there's not really much different in it. Um, it's got a bit of extra padding, but you sort of just get used to it. Um, and yeah, you adjust quite quickly when you're on the sand quite often. Well, our final question is from Sarah, also about beach soccer. Where is your favourite place that you've travelled to play beach soccer? Um, I think it would have to be Saudi Arabia. Um, we went there in November and it's one of those that you probably wouldn't just visit um, for a holiday, but just the culture and um, the experience was definitely up there. Now we've got some quick fire questions that we're going to do just to round off. They're completely random. We quite like doing this with our guests just to get to know them a little bit better. So I'm going to fire five at you. Neil's going to fire five at you. I'm going to start with your favourite current AFC Bournemouth player. Um, it would probably be Neto. You know, same position, and I just love his celebration <laughs> photos. Is that something that you're uh, you're going to get involved in on on the AFC Bournemouth women's pitch? Yeah, I might have to try it. I gave it a little go at the Hampshire Cup final, but I think I need to up my game. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us your favourite takeaway. Um, it's probably, I wouldn't know if you class it as a takeaway, but it's probably Nando's. Um, it's not. It's never as good when you take it away, but it's a great meal. I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell us a joke. Oh, I don't <laughs> think the joke that I've got in mind is very appropriate. Um... I, I'm going to have to pass on that one. <laughs> For the sake of the reputation of the AFC Bournemouth podcast, I will allow you to pass on that one. <laughs> Thanks. Now, I know the answer to this one. Hair in a bun or hair in a ponytail? Oh, hair in a bun. Um, the bun's developed over the years and I think it's still got a bit of work to do, but I couldn't deal with a ponytail any longer. It just blows in the face too often. Scoring a penalty or saving a penalty? Oh, um... I really did enjoy scoring a penalty and having that little bit of striker's glory, but it's got to be saving a penalty as a goalkeeper. Favourite Cherries game? That I've played in or... Let me ask you both. Favourite Cher Cherries game you've watched here and favourite one you've played in? Um, favourite one I've watched was when uh, Bournemouth beat Liverpool 4-3. Um, I came here as part of the women's team and that was the uh, game that we got chosen to watch. And yeah, it was one that I remember and I think everyone is still shocked by that result. Um, and favourite one I've played in it would have to be the Hampshire Cup final Biggest achievement? Biggest achievement um, probably especially on the grass playing at Wembley was always something that I wanted to do as a um, little girl and even now just being able to walk out to the um, on the vitality pitch again comes down to that Morning person or night owl? Oh, It's a tough one I'll probably go between the two but I'll probably say a night owl. Favourite holiday destination? Oh, um, I went to Cape Verde a while back and it seems to be up there of one that's got lots of memories, so I'd definitely like to go back. Tea or coffee? Oh, that's a tough one. Being English, I feel like I should say tea, but since being out in Spain, coffee has done it. <laughs> well, Katie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us. Thank you so much for sitting down, talking to us about your work on the pitch and off the pitch. And we're really looking forward to seeing what you girls can achieve in an exciting new era for the club. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the support that we continue to get on and off the pitch. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be so grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth fans, women's football fans, or just the general football fan can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Katie Scadding and from Neil Parrott and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the AFC Bournemouth podcast.